So thank you, Steven, for attending Canada Recipes. And uh, we are very proud to get you one more uh, year uh, as a speaker. And uh, so we are making a very short interview. And the idea is to help the people watching this video right now uh, to get a better understanding of who is Steven Rushdad, what he's doing, how he went directly to this stuff. You, maybe yes. there is some passion. What was the trigger to make you looking at Linux? So uh, this is the idea of this video. So how did you start it with Linux on all this funny stuff you are doing. Sure. Um, by the way, thank you for having me. Uh, so it's actually started, and I've given this, I've told other people this before uh, in interviews. And I used to work um, at Lockheed Martin, and I worked on uh, Sun Microsystems and AIX and stuff, and I was trying very hard to actually get off of that because I saw it was kind of moving away. This is in the early 90s. And then I saw this, you know, Microsoft was coming up and everyone was doing Microsoft and I tried very hard to get on a project to do Microsoft. So I finally got on there and I spent a lot of time uh, developing something and I was debugging this bug and I spent three days until I found out that the bug I was debugging was actually the debugger for Microsoft. And I was extremely frustrated. I didn't have my bash, like, well, not bash, but the shell commands. I didn't have a lot of the Unix properties that I loved with AIX and Sun Microsystems. And I finally got so frustrated, I, I basically yelled, can't they make a Unix for the PC? And this intern sitting next to me turned around and said, have you ever heard of Linux? And this was in 1996. And I, I was like, what? And I went through, I searched for it, found it. I downloaded a, you know, the 13 floppy drive or floppy disks for Slackware. I installed it. Couldn't quite get my graphic card working, and that was common back then. And um, I fell in love with it ever since. So that's how I got started with just playing with Linux. Uh, for the kernel programming side, that came from, uh, I went back to school to get my master's, uh, story for that. Um, and when I went through my master's, one of the classes was uh, rewriting the uh, TCP IP stack in Linux, at the time it was 2.2 kernel, uh, from a send acknowledgement to a credit negative acknowledgement protocol. Um, that was the basically main project, and that was my first real deep dive into development of, uh, of Linux. And it was also where I found out that the, uh, when you deal with networking, because my, actually my uh, master's thesis was on quality of service networking, I, I, so I was developing on Linux with that. And uh, to debug it, printk wasn't good enough. So I created an internal ring buffer and a, a, uh, uh, a way to trace my, uh, my changes in the code to see how it worked and be able to get it from user space and see how everything works, uh, to be able to read the stuff because the print cave was too slow. I needed something that could handle fast packets and give me information like how is my changes working, what's the timestamps and everything like that. And that was actually really the predecessor to what is now called F-Trace. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what brings you, because it's also part of your history, what brings you to the RT part, to the real-time part of the Linux? Uh, because it's a big yes. thing. Mm -hmm. It's very complicated. It has to be very precise. I mean, it requires a lot of knowledge of what is an, uh, a real class system. So, how did you, how did you went into the, this part of the Linux kernel? Uh, that part, uh, I, I worked for Lockheed Martin, and then uh, this uh, small startup company called TimeSys, uh, which was in Pittsburgh, started up. There was a, one of the guys, one of the people, uh, a fellow at Lockheed Martin, uh, was like a vice president of TimeSys. Uh, his friend was the uh, CEO. And he didn't want to move to Pittsburgh, so he wanted to create an office in the area where I lived. So he created a small office, and I basically begged to get onto this because their, the job was to port their version of Linux to different um, architectures. So I really I had to beg because my background was more on user space. I didn't have a, um, a kernel professional kernel development um, uh, history that was all in uh, academia. And I talked my way into getting into that job, and I actually did very well there. And from there, um, they wanted me to move, and I didn't want to, and I became a contractor to still work for them, but for my home. And then Siemens in Germany uh, realized, hey, he, you know, Stevens is contracting, and they wanted me to work on their stuff because they were a customer as well for time. So, so I ended up going, living back and forth to Germany for three years there. And eventually the Siemens said, could you develop a real-time Linux for us. And before then, I said, you know, before I go and do it myself, let me see if anyone else is doing this. And that's when I came across Ingo Molnar, Thomas Gleichner, Peter Zolstra, and others um, working on this uh, real-time preempt kernel. And so I took their kernel. Actually, my first job was actually creating an earliest deadline first on top of that. 
which is, you know, we're just talking about SCAD deadline today, but this is back in uh, 2004 uh, that I was doing this. And so I started working on that with, in 2004, and I worked on that till 2006 when Ingo Molnar um, liked my work back then, and he offered, he said, Steve, would you like to come work for Red Hat with us? Um, as per today, what brings your passion? I mean, what motivates you every single day on your daily work? So what is, uh, for your opinion, what is the most important things or components or the social things or the technical thing? The domain, I don't know, what brings your passion today on Linux? Well, it's one of those sad things that, you know, we all realize that when you, like I'm 49, um, next year I'll be 50, and, you know, it's one of those sad things that we all have to say we're getting older. And I, there's... Back 10, 15 years ago, I had goals set out. And I have to, I'm proud to say that I think I've accomplished all the goals I set out back then. Uh, that was to do, you know, get involved in the Linux kernel, do some crazy stuff there, make an impact. Um, I did it, I did all that. And I did a lot of technical stuff. I, I'm uh, proud of my work that I've done and I've had other work, but now I feel like I'm at an age where I can't be doing it anymore. I mean, I, I need to start helping others fulfill their dreams. And I actually, uh, one of my motivations is uh, to get other to help others working on the kernel to get them more up to speed. I just mentioned today that we have a full-time employee working on Kernel Shark. Uh, I'm helping him. I'm directing him on that. I'm not doing any of the code. I mean, I just look at his. I just review. I don't write code. It's it's going to be his work only. He's in uh, Bulgaria. Uh, Sofia Sofia is where he'll be located, and hopefully he'll stump, he'll come out of the uh, you know woodworks and be giving talks maybe sometime later. Uh, so, I'm my, like I said, what motivates me now is basically to still make an impact. Uh, as people know, I moved from Red Hat to recently to VMware. And my impact there is to try to make VMware into a more open source friendly company. And I see a change, or I've only been there for nine months, I've already seen a change within the cultural atmosphere there. And I think we are making an impact. Um, what would be your advice for the newcomers? Not to be afraid of getting back to maybe more um, experienced people and to get knowledge. Or, or can we convince them to come to you or to the others to start their, their first job, their first patch of their first review on the Linux kernel? What would be your advice for them? Well, this is kind of funny. We're actually we're just talking about this between a few high-level um, maintainers. Uh, and we're saying, you know, when was it where you found out that you're now the one that people look up to, kind of? and. Um, it's, I laugh because when I first started uh, Red Hat, I didn't want to go. I was actually intimidated to join Red Hat because everyone that interviewed me, I knew all the developers at the time. They were all high-level developers, and I, was, I didn't want to go. But one of the Red Hat employees that was saying there was like, Steve, why aren't you going? I said, you know, I feel like I'm moving from the little leagues to the big leagues, and that um, I don't know if I could compete with these people. And the response back was, you know, if you didn't feel that way, you wouldn't belong here. He says, don't worry, in five years, you're going to be one of those people that people are afraid to approach you. And it sort of happened. And I tell people, and this is, we're all laughing, like, we're, all, we're the same. As those are coming up, we were there. We were all at that point. I, every, time, every time someone comes up to me, I'm like, are you, in five years, are you going to be the big one that everyone talks about? Is, are you going to be the one that I'm going to say, I'm proud I know this person? Um, so don't be afraid. I mean, it actually... If you are afraid, that's good. That's a good feeling. That means you're, you're in the right place. So, like I said, don't be afraid. And um, if you get involved, try to learn as much as you can and take advice. You know, if someone tells you, you no, know, code this way, or this is how you approach someone, listen to them and follow them. Don't try to fight saying, I don't like to do that. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for accepting this uh, short interview. And thank you uh, one more time for being one of the kind of recipe speakers. We are very proud to get you every year. Uh, to eat, and we always enjoy your conference. So, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, I love coming here. So, like I said, this is, I tell people this is my favorite conference. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Stephen.